Okay, our next talk is called by Hash. Give it up for Julian. Thank you. In the 1940s, uh, two psychologists, uh, Abraham and Edith Luchens, they came up with uh, these, these uh, experiments that became somewhat influential. And they're, they're called these uh, water jar problems. Uh, and the idea is you have these three jars, um, and they have different capacities. And the test subject, which in this case happens to be all of you, um, is expected to add up using these jars, filling them up, removing water from them, to a certain goal. Uh, so you see a few of these problems, and you're supposed to solve them. So here is a sort of training example. Uh, we have one with only two jars. And the first jar, A, has 29 liters, or has the capacity for 29 liters. Um, and the second jar has a capacity for three liters. Our goal is 20. So what we can do is fill up the jar with 29, and then three times over, remove uh, three liters each time from the one with 20. So OK, so, so let's try this experiment. Um, I'm going to show some, some of these problems on the board. Um, I'll give you all a few seconds to think about it. And then I'll ask someone to tell me a solution. Does that work? All right. 21, 127, and 3. And the goal is to reach to 100. I'll give you a few seconds. Any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you start with 127, remove 21, remove 3, remove 3 again, and you get to 100. Uh, now a slightly different problem, 163, sorry, 14, 163, 25, and the goal is 99. I'll give you a few seconds. All right, any ideas? Yeah. Uh, 20. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, one more. And by the way, uh, at the end of this talk, you can all put this in your CV. I'm really good at water jar problems. <laughs> one more. Again, a few seconds. Yeah. So 43 minus 18, minus 10, minus 10 again. Yeah. All right. All right. Another one. I know this is, seems like it's getting boring. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what? Yeah. OK. So uh, the, the funny thing about science is that it's not as reproducible as Nix is. <laughs> you people are a bit smarter. Um, so the effect that uh, the Luchins observed, and this is, I've tried this on a few people, and, uh, and it really does happen, is that most people answer 49 minus 23 minus 3 minus 3. Um, and maybe some of you thought of this as the solution. Uh, and it's really very interesting, because people who are in the control group, they immediately see 23 minus 3. It's the simpler solution. They answer very quickly. Uh, but the people who have been exposed to the four previous, three previous trials that, um, that I gave, they tend to answer the more complicated solution, and they tend to take longer to answer. So I might have biased the result by letting the first person to an answer to, to, to give the answer. right? Um, but this is called uh, the Einstellung effect. Um, and the idea is that you know, pr prior experience can actually reduce your ability to solve a problem well. Um, and you know, the Einstellung, uh, Einstellung, in addition to sort of uh, stance, also means preferences. So if you have your uh, computer set to, um, to German, you might see it, and you have a Mac, which I suspect that no one here does. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, then you, you might see Einstellung or Einstellung in there. OK, but this talk is about Nix. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I'm Julian. I'm uh, the founder and CEO at Garnix. And what we do is we try to make, you know, Nix be the only thing that you have to worry about. Um, you push, you have, if you have a Git repo um, and you have a flake.nix, you push it uh, to a Garnix enabled uh, website. We build everything for you in CI. Uh, we cache it. It's really fast and you don't have to do anything. But one feature that we added recently is hosting. So if you have an Express configuration, you can very easily deploy on every commit. Um, and this is not what I'm going to talk about. It, rather, I'm going to be talking about an idea, a principle, a concept uh, that we adopted uh, that I think is really, really powerful uh, while developing this hosting. If you want to try out the hosting itself, at 4.55, I believe, we have a workshop in the other room. Um, and hosting, is, I think, is really cool. You should come to it. Um, but Nix, really, really great. I think most people here will agree. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, Nix OS, kind of surprising that, you know, in addition to a build tool package manager, we also get this, um, this extra thing, this entire you know, distro um, that's really wonderful for your personal laptop. It's also really wonderful as a deployment target for servers. It's kind of like a, a great boon that we get both of these things. And uh, NixOS is, I think, really, really phenomenal from the perspective of a static configuration. If you look at your Git repo, uh, there's really no, no better way of configuring. If you look at the code itself, there's really no better way of configuring uh, servers or a personal laptop. Uh, but there is this awkward in-between moment when you're changing things, mutating things. And that's kind of what I, when I want. You know, what happens in between one configuration and another? How do you get from one to the other? Uh, and this is, I think, if we start there, we get to an idea that I think is very, very cool and kind of shows us how to extend uh, the idea of Nix and NixOS to the cloud so that we can really sort of beat the existing tools at their own game in various ways. Uh, so, you know, switch to configuration is the de facto answer to um, how to get from one configuration to another. Um, and by this, I'm including NixOS Rebuild Switch. I'm including DeployRS, Comina, Comina, I think, as well. Um, all these tools at some level, when you, wanna, you know, when you have a system deployed, whether it is your laptop or a server or website running NixOS, uh, on some level, this is always what you're using. Um, again, your laptop, uh, let's say that you want to upgrade the version of Nix packages that your NixOS laptop is using. What do you do? You change the flake.lock if you're using flakes or the configuration.nix if, if you're not using flakes to point to the new version, NIV potentially. And once you have the code that represents the new version, uh, you do a NixOS rebuild switch or you do a, a switch to configuration. And this works and it's really nice and you have rollbacks. Um, if you have a home lab and you're you know, deploying something there, you made a change to your networking or your firewall or whatever it is, you write, it, you write the change in code. It's really clear what the change is. And then you do an XOS rebuild switch on the server itself, somehow get the thing onto the server uh, and do a switch. If you have a personal website, <laughs> this is my idea of how personal websites look. You know, you have something that you're sh sharing. Um, with a few friends, uh, but you know, it's not sort of high intensity, big uptime type of thing. Uh, and you have, I don't know, like a Go web server or with a TypeScript front end or whatever, however it is that you write these things. If you change your application, again, uh, you have probably the change in the Git repo and then somehow you get that change. You, you do a, bi a build, you do a switch to configuration, you use one of these deploy tools that basically automate the process for you, or you write a bash script that does this automatically for you. But this is the essential technique still. If you have a company that's very small, that has only you know, one server, again, same answer. right? You probably have maybe a bit more of automation. Uh, but notice that this is beginning to look bad um, because you have downtime, for instance. So let's see some other issues. And if you have a, a bigger company, uh, more users, more services, maybe you make a change on two different services at the same time and the API that communicates between them. And again, the answer is, how do we get this deployed? NixOS rebuild switch, something like that, 
first on one server and then on the other, or both concurrently, still ultimately NixOS rebuild switch. And <laughs> you might see where this was going. I think that this is the same, we're, we're falling prey to the same problem. We're falling prey to this Einstellung effect where we have a tool that works really, really well for your laptop and for your home lab. And we don't recognize uh, its shortcomings in many of these other situations. Um, and I think this is really holding us back again, right? Like I think NixOS could be a much better deployment target than Kubernetes and Docker and whatnot. It has so many things going for it. But we have to be clear-eyed about what its shortcomings are if we want to get to the stage where we can con convince everyone to switch to NixOS and be right, right? Uh, we have to yeah, be right to do so. Uh, yeah. Um, so what are these problems, right? Like I'm saying that they're problems, but I haven't really specified what they are. I kind of mentioned one briefly, zero downtime. Uh, what's the problem here? Well, if you have a server and you're doing a re NixOS rebuild switch on that server, uh, the systemd units go down. Um, if you do a boot, it might even reboot. Um, the systemd units go down. Maybe the network goes down briefly. Uh, definitely, probably your app goes down. Uh, it has to be restarted, um, at least by default. Uh, and so you have a few seconds of downtime. Uh, and again, in your home lab, who cares? In your, your, in your laptop, yeah, it's a little bit inconvenient to wait for five seconds, but given the enormous convenience of using NixOS in the first place, who cares? On, on, you know, in prod, whether a small company or a larger one, this begins to matter. And you might still say, oh, I'm working in a small company, we don't care about six seconds of downtime, five seconds, 10 seconds of downtime. But the problem isn't just that. The problem is uh, that if you go this route, and something fails during the deploy, if the system D units fail to start up, you now are confronted with even more downtime and a situation of extreme anxiety um, because you're debugging in prod. And if you do a rollback, pretty cool that you have rollbacks. They don't always work, but they usually do. Uh, pretty cool that you have rollbacks. But now you've traded one problem for another because, OK, the system is back up, but you've been treating your server as a pet not as a cattle. You've been deploying again and again to the same server. And so now it's been up for God knows how long and has developed its own unique history. And that history is influencing potentially what happens when you do a NixOS rebuild switch. So you won't find it easy necessarily to reproduce the issue locally in a VM. In fact, the tests that you had maybe even did this. They, they tried to, to see whether uh, starting up the VM with your supposed configuration uh, worked. And it did maybe in your tests, but not on prod, because these are different environments already, right? Um, and another problem is, if you're doing this, you know, six seconds of downtime, I'm, I picked six randomly, it seems like roughly the right figure, but obviously it's going to vary from person to person and situation to situation. Uh, six seconds of downtime once a day is not a problem. But six seconds of downtime 30, 50, 100 times a day, I don't know, 10 times a day, uh, becomes a problem, even in small companies. And so what this means is you never really want to have CI, CD, automated deployments, on every push to main if you're doing something that causes this much downtime. So you never automate that process, and it is always manual. Um, and the time, the velocity, the time between you making a change that goes to main, you or your coworkers or, or collaborators or whatever it is, uh, the time between you making a change that gets to main and it being live increases, and you're doing this work manually. So this zero downtime thing really sort of hides another problem, which is you want automatic deployments, and uh, NixOS Rebuild Switch is getting in the way. Uh, there's another problem, uh, which is atomic upgrades. Um, what I mean by this is, again, the problems we're seeing are kind of uh, tearing at the seams of, of this notion that uh, the commits are the only, uh, the only moments of truth in your deployed system. And tr in fact, there is this interstitial states, this, these deployments, right? And with atomic upgrades, that issue becomes more prevalent. Uh, 
But for the problem of, of downtime, maybe you set up, um, maybe you set up some sort of very manual system with a rollover or whatever, and that could have been a lot of work. But combined with this, you're in trouble. Um, atomic upgrades are what I mean is something like if you're deploying with an express rebuild switch and you have two servers and they're talking to one another, what's going to happen is that you're going to have different versions. You, you make a change, you make a commit, maybe you change an API, right? An API, an internal API, where two servers are talking to one another. And you go from uh, an endpoint giving a string to it giving a JSON object. But you change the client and the server in the same commit. So in your tests, everything is green. In the snapshot view where commits are all the truth, nothing ever went wrong. But when you try deploying, there are, going to be, there are going to be two moments. There's going to be a moment in between where either one server is up um, uh, with the new version and the other with the old version, or vice versa, or sometimes even mixtures of versions if you have redundancy, or downtime. Uh, so these are some of the problems. And uh, in my opinion, when you start looking at this problem, you realize that we kind of fixated on the wrong thing, which is using switch, OS, switch to configuration for everything, whereas we should have uh, fixated on immutability. <laughs> what I mean by that is that we're doing the original sin that Nix was supposed to save us from. We have one name, which is the URL of your server, and what it means keeps changing because you keep deploying new things. And I'll, I'll, I'll show how that, that problem sort of causes a lot of the issues that we see. And once we get rid of that problem, uh, a whole new sort of landscape opens up. Uh, now, on Garnix, so again, this is a, about a design pattern or idea, an idea or something, but we implemented this in Garnix, and I'll explain a little bit how it works. Um, so you don't have to do anything in Garnix by default. If you have a flake.nix and push, it'll build the things. It'll build the NixOS configuration as well. Uh, but if you additionally add a garnix.yaml with this, for instance, and it so happens that you have a NixOS configuration that's called my backend, well, I said so happens, but obviously it's not coincidence. You should check whether the names are the same. Uh, then what this is saying is that on every commit to main, uh, I want you to redeploy this. So again, you add this, um, you commit it. We're going to spin up without any extra work. We're going to spin up your server for you. And in a minute, it'll be ready, and you'll have uh, you know, a server running. Uh, if you delete this file and, and push, it'll tear down the server. So no provisioning work for you. Uh, but every time you make a change and commit, we're going to update your server. Or rather, we're going to do, do this with zero downtime. We're going to spin up a server on the side. Uh, once that server is ready, functioning, then we switch traffic to it. And I say switch traffic when I, just a moment ago, I said that you shouldn't do this. I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. Uh, but by default, you get these uh, URLs for, you know, they just get generated for you. Um, and usually, you know, either you, you give your friends that URL or you put a C name to it and we do HTTPS for you and whatnot. Uh, but then that server is going to be accessible in that URL. This is still committing the same sin, um, but it's sometimes practical. Uh, but the crucial thing is you also get uh, each one of your machines, you can have multiple ones on Garnix, each one of them gets uh, a hash URL. And the hash is the hash of the configuration. Uh, so that never changes. What's behind that hash URL is always going to be the same thing. A lot like you know your nix slash slower slash some hash slash Python is always going to be the same Python. So you can kind of think this, of this as uh, kind of the next door of the cloud, right, of servers <laughs> behind every entry in this next door, which has names that are URLs. You have a, a single server, a single NixOS configuration. This buys us a lot. It's, it's really amazing. If you so, spend some time thinking about this, there's just so many things that are cool about it. But to talk a little bit about how you use it, it's, it's, it's a lot like how you use packages in, in or store paths in Nix, right? Like you have interpolation. And wherever, here we have two Nix OS configurations, the front end and the back end. The front end makes a request to the back end. 
And when you're writing this, you use this Gynix lib thing that just calculates the URL for you. Uh, and the interesting thing here is, uh, you know, you, you're writing this in a fairly easy way, but of course, as you all know, this gets replaced by a hash, uh, much like with uh, you know packages Python. Uh, and when the back end changes, the front end changes as well. The, the you know there's a when you push there'll be a redeployment, and um, but the converse is not true. If the front end changes, then the back end does, doesn't. So um, let's use a picture here to to make clearer what's going on. We have uh, these we have this infrastructure, let's say, uh, a bunch of servers. And the arrows indicate that that server makes a request to the server the arrow is going to. And at the very right here, maybe I should get out of the way. Uh, at the very right here, we have something that's supposed to indicate the public internet. Um, so the state of the art uh, for, uh, for a lot of these problems is you know a lot of people use rolling deployments that don't solve the, solve the atomic upgrade issue, but a lot of people use blue green deployments. And the basic idea here is, you spin up your entire infrastructure and new, whatever servers you have, spin up new versions of them. Once they're ready, you switch traffic over. And then you know once the old ones have finished what they're doing, however you measure that, then you can uh, shut them down. Uh, now, and now you have the new infrastructure. And this is cool. Uh, it gives you semantic guarantees that I meant, right? Like this zero downtime uh, atomic upgrades, which together mean that you can really think of your infrastructure in terms of commits, in terms of what happens at those commits and nothing in between. Uh, it gives you that. But it requires a decent amount of extra work and it has some problems. Uh, one of them is that you had to sp spin up the entire infrastructure anew, uh, and that's costly and slow. Another problem is that when we had the two infrastructures running concurrently, how is it that one server in the new infrastructure was talking to another server in the new infrastructure and not to the old one? How did we not get the wires crossed? The answer is usually we have a service mesh or service discovery or some other infrastructure that says that allows each deployment to resolve its uh, hosts in a way that remains specific to that host. And this is, this is how you get to Kubernetes. You start adding these things <laughs> that are you know, sidecars and all these other sort of things that need to exist in order for Kubernetes to work. Um, and then it's really hard to run locally, and you know, like they're, it's really hard to run it in your own infrastructure, self-host or whatever it is, because you're adding all of these extra things to make this concept work. Whereas once you have this very simple idea of hash URLs, um, when you change that, as we saw, if you change that server, you're going to change that server, and you're going to change that server in the same way that if you change the back end, the front end changes. The, the commits change. So it's very clear that you have to deploy something new. The hash, sorry, the hash URLs changed. And so we deploy uh, only those three things. And, the, and because the, um, the interpolations are being resolved to different things now, we don't need anything special to make this work. They're just actually, the arrows actually represent different URLs, right? Like when this is pointing to this, it's because it's pointing to a different hash URL. Uh, in the same way that if you update your next packages version and various packages change, like everything just works, right? Um, so, so th th there's a lot of things that are really great about this. I mean, one thing, one very basic thing is that like now, in the same way that you can see your dependency uh, graph when you have a, a package, right? You, there are all these tools. I think Next Tree is the, the popular one. Uh, there might be other ones as well, uh, where you can see all the dependencies of a package. Here, you you, you can see your entire infrastructure <laughs> um, statically, right? Like you don't need any extra tools. This is. This is often surprisingly hard in, in real world to like figure out what's talking to what uh, in, in, in a world that's different than this is, is often surprisingly hard. Uh, another thing is like it's very easy to, if you want to start a server locally, 
uh, a front end locally that's talking to the same back end that's deployed, but it's a new version of the front end, that's also really easy. You can control very, very intuitively what back end that's talking to. Uh, and it, it makes, you know, for Nix users at least, all of these things make a lot of sense. I mean, an example of this is we have pull request deployments on Garnix as well. Uh, instead of having the type on branch, it has type on pull request. And I now added both the front end and the back end. So now we have four servers being deployed, two of them whenever the traditional sort of deployment, whenever main gets a new commit, but then two of them, the same infrastructure, whenever there's a pull request. So you can preview what the change is going to be. Uh, and the cool thing about this is that if you want to, without any, if you do exactly this, uh, then every time you change the front end, for instance, it's going to talk to the old back end. Right? Um, but if you don't want to, if you want it to be different, you can just add a string in, in, uh, in the back end. Probably, if you don't want to, it's because of persistence, actually. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, actually, <laughs> we're talking about that now. Um, persistence is, is um, you know, probably for following along, may, uh, this all sounds great. But if in your mind you thought about persistence, you know, what, what's happening here is like every time we deploy, we deploy a new server. Uh, and this is kind of like this stateless deployments that are so popular, uh, so universally acknowledged as the right thing to do um, in larger deployments nowadays. Um, but of course, it doesn't work for state, right? Because you start a new server every time you deploy. Uh, if there's anything that happened, got saved in the file system, it's going to get lost. And usually that's really good because again, like you know, we're the community that uses tools like impermanence to wipe out our <laughs> our hard disk on purpose. So we presumably understand why this is good. It's easier to reproduce things um, in addition to zero downtime and atomicity. Uh, but if you if you have a database, that's definitely not what you want. <laughs> um, the answer. So how do you solve this in this in this infrastructure? Uh, the answer we came across, which I think is, is very nice, um, is that you should think of all these servers as having a name that by default is the hash, the hash of the configuration. And every time you deploy, you say, oh, what's the name of the server? Um, does it exist already? If it exists already um, and it's exactly the same, then you don't have, if nothing changed, you don't have to do anything. It's already deployed. If, if the name already exists, and, uh, and the, the, the definition has changed, uh, then you deploy to the same uh, system. So you're allowed to pick a name. By default, the name is the hash URL. But you're allowed to pick a name, such as DB or DB1. And then we'll continue deploying every time to the same, uh, to the same server, exactly how you're used to. But we separated out the persistence uh, from everything else. And so now, yeah, you get downtime. You get downtime when, uh, when you deploy a new version of Postgres or when you have a schema change. But that happens much, much less frequently than all the other changes. Um, OK. Now, some of the ideas, I'm going to say this very, very quickly and briefly because uh, um, <laughs> it's, you know, uh, there are a lot of directions to go. Uh, but some of the ideas that we sort of think about once we st started inhabiting the space, um, this conceptual space, let's say, uh, is that you know, we could potentially just leave these URLs running forever if we, have, uh, if we can spin machines down on demand and spin them up on demand as well when a request comes in. Uh, then you can imagine, like every, it's a little bit like IPFS or something. Everything exists forever, but the, what we're saying exists forever are, are servers. And so, so certain things become possible, such as sharing externally the, these hash URLs. Um, you can put this in your front end, for instance. So a problem that exists very of, often in, in web apps is that uh, your front end, um, you, you deploy a new infrastructure and you deploy a new front end, but there's someone who's had their browser open for the past 24 hours or past week, and they have the old version of your front end. And so there's a mismatch. You know, there, there's an old front end talking to the new infrastructure, and this causes problems because maybe the API changed, expectations changed, but you can't really force them to upgrade because they might lose state. If we allow everything to coexist, which we can now because names don't conflict anymore, we can allow this 
uh, front end to keep talking to the old version, we can allow consumers of our API generally to keep talking to the old version. So we can upgrade versions fearlessly uh, because you know, our users, our clients can upgrade their version on demand by, by changing the hash rel whenever they're ready. But you know, in order to get this to work, we kind of need persistence to actually be zero downtime, and moreover, allow multiple versions of different schemas to coexist. Because maybe you're changing the schema behind, and you know, like if, if that's the change that you made to the infrastructure, uh, th there's a problem here. And this is, again, uh, zero downtime, multiple versions, uh, persistence. This is, uh, this is not something we implemented yet, but this is something we've been looking into, uh, and it's pretty cool. Uh, there are, you know, there's a lot of prior literature on this, um, uh, but I won't have time to go exactly into how this works. Um, but what I want to say is, um, I think, you know, this is a. I think I, I mentioned sort of that we should be clear-eyed about what's happening here, right? And and these things, these things that maybe we we pretend don't, we don't care that much about, um, you know, we like. Like a lot of the advantages of Nixon, we maybe downplay to our coworkers who we need to convince or whatever the problems with it, um, and that's not really fair on them <laughs> and on the truth itself. Um, and I think you know uh, if we realize that these things, downtime, uh, uh, atomic upgrades, um, easy debuggability, uh, if these if we realize that these things are important, we can do a really good job of converting people to using NixOS in, in, in in production, um, and like that's a that's a world that I really want, right? Like a, a world where you can like, without sacrificing, I don't know, like salary or without sacrificing um, interest in the product that the company makes or interest in the coworkers, uh, without sacrificing your morality, you just walk into a job and you know that you're going to be dealing with NixOS, right? Like that's cool. Um, and moreover, the bigger the community gets, um, you know, the more people will be contributing to it. And I think also from a sort of self-interested perspective, like these problems, even if we don't always think of them as problems, they are. And they make, you know, like deploying manually every time. We think of ourselves probably as a community very much as tinkerers. But if you don't have to manually deploy all the time, like you can do so much more, right? Um, yeah, and I think that this is... Uh, a really positive way of going about it. Anyhow, thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. And also, thanks so much for Garnix. It's my favorite CI service I've ever used. Thank you. Uh, I was kind of curious when you showed embedding the hash URLs in the configuration, does that make it harder to spin this like cluster up? You know, locally or to self-host it because now you're kind of hard coding these URLs, or could you maybe stub that out so that that works locally? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, usually, the, the so the way in which we've been using it ourselves is um, we actually just put everything in the same machine, right? Um, and and then that works differently. But that is co absolutely correct. And I, I feel like uh, it was actually a bit unfair of me to say like you don't need extra extra runtime support. You do need uh, you do need something that resolves these these uh, names into the right thing, but it's much easier to implement because it's a static mapping, right? Uh, but you do need support, yeah. So you do need to. By default, it will talk to the Garnix servers, right? Um, but but uh, it should be relatively easy to fix, although we haven't. And, and then one short follow-on in this graph, and and you described uh, like showing a tree of all of your services. Yeah. Like this is a DAG, and it would seemingly have to be to be a tree. Uh, yes. But is there ever a situation where you actually do want like cyclic dependencies between servers, and is yeah. that a problem in this? Yeah. There definitely is. Uh, the problem. Uh, that's a very good point. Uh, and this is usually a, you know, whenever you're hashing something. Uh, you're going to have uh, issues with cyclic dependencies. Uh, the solution, which we, again, right now we disallow uh, uh, cyclic dependency, uh, uh, these cyclic dependencies. It is something that you sometimes want. Uh, uh, often the way in which it manifests itself is actually as a callback or like a webhook, in which case it's dynamic, uh, which is a, kind of a different problem. But, uh, uh, but in the case where you want it statically, uh, 
the solution that I've seen, I think, from Unison and a couple of other places is you, whenever you de detect a cycle, you sort of separate that out and you hash the cycle all together, and then you have, and then you say like part one or part two of that, and you give that the name, right? Uh, so that's that's the solution that we sort of said. Okay, once this problem becomes more serious and more urgent, we're somewhat confident in that we have at least a conceptual solution here, right? Uh, cool. Thank you. How do you um, handle uh, knowing when a newly deployed server is ready. So if you have like some domain name pointing yeah. to the like root of your, your entry point to your stuff, yeah. how do you know when to flip that? Or conversely, um, how do you know when you know something in the middle when the thing it depends on is is ready? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, the the essential idea, and this is both true for. Uh, spinning up and down, uh, is we kind of, uh, the philosophy is somewhat like a system D, uh, system D is, you know, readiness pro probes, for instance, at least we move them towards system D. Uh, so multi-user target is, means I'm ready. So you can decide manually, this is when uh, the server is ready. You use the same sort of techniques that you already, are, most people are familiar with, most people here are familiar with, which is system D. And then for spinning down as well, because one of the things I mentioned I didn't mention is it's also uh, figuring out when it is that you can safely shut, shut down a server is actually a complicated problem as well. And we do CI, right? So this is actually for for a lot of people this doesn't matter that much. Wait for five minutes and everything is fine. Uh, but we do CI, and it turns out that this is uh, very helpful in that. Um, but uh, but yeah, the answer tends to be system D. Yeah. So do you have system D, like once it gets to multi-user target, does it like call out to something else to just say, in the same update, the, update the C name or something to point to the hash URL? Uh, no, just in the same SSH process. So like say, like, when are you done? Uh, when are you done with multi-user? Oh, right. You deploy with SSH and then just wait for it to yeah. be done. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, in terms, w one part of the question that I didn't really answer is like, how do servers know that one another is ready? We don't do that, right? Like, we kind of expect you, if you have a dependency, we're gonna we notice that, and so we spin up your dependency. Uh, but we don't do any logic in terms of saying, hey, like now we can spin this other thing up. We kind of assume that somewhere in your startup scripts, you, you'll you'll say, okay, my dependency is ready, therefore I'm ready, or or I can st take the next step. Uh, Maybe just a few more. It sounds like you can do the same, but without running a new uh, machines. Like, apply this to the systemd services on the same machine. Like, have them have different hashes and names and stuff. And yeah. that would make it faster, maybe? Y yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that that's right. I actually I have a lot of opinions on this, but I don't know if I'll get to express all of them as part of this answer. Um, <laughs> uh, I think that's right. There is a lot of uh, global, like ports, for instance, right? Like, uh, if you like, why is it that you can't aggregate like a monoid sum or something to servers? If you have two two Next West servers, um, uh, will the behavior of the sort of union of them? Uh, the concatenation of them or be the same as the two separate servers. Um, and there's some cases like, for instance, ports where, where, where it's not the case. And so you need to do some logic there. And I personally feel like Nix would be nicer if you didn't have uh, port literals, for instance. Um, but this is kind of a rabbit hole. Right? Uh, yeah, like I Kubernetes, you could allocate ports. It what? You could allocate ports dynamically. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You. Yeah. You. you no, no one statically knows what the, the, the port is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I have another question. Yeah. Uh, the hash URL, the hash domain name that you have. Yeah. Is it uh, global? So if two different yeah, people yeah. Have the same thing, <laughs> they get the same server that might have different. Yeah. Things. Yeah. It, it is. It is. Um, I mean. You know, one version of that that's very natural is, uh, you know, if you want to do load balancing, you would do want to sort of have multiple servers under the same name. Um, but it's a bit, it, it's very strange, um, and again, very nixy, but very strange, 
that if someone has exactly the same source code as you and they deploy it, uh, they're going to get the same hash URL. And you think, this cannot be a good idea, right? Uh, but it turns out that you know, if they do that, if they have the same hash URL, it means that they have the same secrets, that they have the same access to. Uh, we encrypt the secrets uh, with SOPs and whatnot, and we have a system for that. Um, they have access to the same database already. Uh, and so I believe this is actually a, a, a wonderful opportunity in some sense for a different type of like more uh, P2P uh, edge computing or something, uh, in the sense that uh, with, you know, if, if we collectively decide that we want some service to, um, to exist here in this room, and that service is somewhat open source, uh, then we can spin that up. And you know, this sort of uh, local, uh, uh, a lot of the sort of anycast uh, sort of uh, scenarios become very interesting. I'm, I'm being very hand wavy, and I think part of the reason is because I don't know exactly how this would work. Uh, but it feels like there, there's, a, there's a way in which everyone can collaborate to hosting these things. Right? And, and to get even more intense about this, uh, <laughs> what we could do is have like, multiple sort of service providers um, uh, that put the uh, that are, uh, CAs for uh, HTTPS certificates, um, and you put the uh, TLS certificate in the server, and you sign it if you're one of these uh, things. And then you can have sort of like either multiple sources of trust or whatever. And then you can ask anyone, hey, like, who's running this type of server? And if you trust, if there's a sort of either web of trust or, or else like a tree of trust, you can kind of talk to any of them, right? Um, but again, th these are kind of crazy ideas. We're kind of, for now, pretty solidly grounded in the practical use cases of your you know, getting your Nixos server out there, uh, but it's nice to think about these things. Okay, let's give our speaker another round of applause. <laughs>